Well, it's uh, five o'clock here, so um, uh, let's um, make a start. So it's a great pleasure this week to uh, introduce Bjorn Hof uh, from uh, Vienna, who's going to tell us about uh, transition to turbulence control, or from transition to turbulence control. Over to you, Bjorn. Thanks a lot, Phil, and uh, it's a pleasure um, to be invited to, to give this seminar. Um, uh, let me, so I, I want to talk about quite a, a number of things in this talk and I'm not sure how, you know, how far I will get, but I, 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 if I'm going too fast at any point, um, please um, interrupt and speak up. And um, I'm also sort of relying that uh, this, you know, some of you listened to Dwight Barclay's talk last week and that he did uh, sort of part of the, the groundwork and I can build up on that. But yeah, let's see. Let me start um, straight away with a couple of videos. So transition to turbulence, what you will find are localized structures that back down, in this case, the pipe in the upper example. You have these puffs of turbulence that sweep past. And even if you would follow these puffs, they wouldn't change much. I mean, they are chaotic inside, of course, but the, their size and their average speed would be pretty much constant. And it's very similar if you look at um, if you look at other shear flows like quet or channel flow. And I have an example of channel flow here where we start with a localized perturbation and you see these stripes start to form. And then the channel is uh, ending, unfortunately. But what you saw before it ended is basically these stripes are not space filling and you have gaps in between the stripes where the flow is more or less laminar. So in both cases, you have exist coexistence of turbulence and of laminar flow. So that's important to keep in mind. And, and this uh, story of transition goes back to the 19th century and to Osborne Reynolds. Uh, this is not him. This is actually a picture from his, his paper and some technician or something is, is shown here with his setup. Uh, so it's a straight pipe, basically. Uh, gravity driven in this case doesn't really matter too much. And uh, he injected dye into a nozzle uh, at the entrance of the pipe and then downstream in the pipe, you would see if the dye mixes, if it's in turbulent state or like in the first example here, it's just going down being laminar and the dye does not mix. You have a dye streak in the middle of the pipe. Second example, at higher velocities, you get these uh, patches of turbulence that I just mentioned, you know, called turbulent puffs. Um, that, that then go down the pipe, as I said, more or less at constant length, constant speed, they will just affect downstream. And they will come at irregular uh, intervals. That's why Reynolds called them flashes. But we, we'll stick to the more recent technology of puffs. And if you go to even higher velocities, of course, then you get fully turbulent flow at least some distance from the inlet. Yeah. And um, what Reynolds already pretty much realized in this, uh, in this very first paper on the subject is that the laminar flow is, is in pipes is linearly stable. And uh, this is what gives rise to this coexistence then. So you, you find turbulence in regimes, parameter regimes, where, where the flow is linearly stable. And of course, the main purpose of the paper was to introduce the Reynolds number and he uh, Reynolds um, um, took as an example the transition and he said that typically turbulence will appear at Reynolds 2000 in this form of flashes. But then he realized as he improved his uh, setup that um, he could keep flows also laminar up to 13,000, I think 12 or 13,000 in his paper. And uh, there was no sign of turbulence only when he went above. So. And this led him to the conclusion, as I said, that the laminar flow is linearly stable. You need perturbations of finite amplitude to trigger turbulence. And um, <clears throat> you know, to still conclude that the Reynolds number is the single parameter that you need for the problem, he uh, justified this in a manner that he, he said um, that there should be a real critical value of, he didn't call it Reynolds number, of course, at the time, but uh, of velocity where, um, and this is not the one where pipe, the pipe necessarily goes turbulent, but the real critical value has to be defined in a way that um, this is the point where you can have turbulence if you perturb the flow. You know, if you don't perturb the flow, you can be at 
10 times higher velocity, still perfectly laminar, doesn't mean there isn't a critical point. So he said that in his own words, let me read it out from his paper, it became clear to me that if in a tube of sufficient length, and the sufficient length is actually key to, to the problem, even though it may not seem like it, but the observation time is, is an issue. So if in a tube of sufficient length, the water were at first admitted in a high state of disturbance, so let's say at the entrance of the stream, then as the water proceeded along the tube, the disturbance would settle down into a steady condition, which condition would be one of eddies, so that's what he called turbulence, or steady motion, so turbulence or laminar, according to whether the velocity was above or below what may be called the real critical value. Okay, so you don't have a critical point where your flow goes turbulent, turbulent on its own account, at least I mean, for every setup, there will be such a point where, where you, your pipe goes turbulent, but it's not universal. The universal one should be the one where in presence of uh, perturbations, initially you perturb the flow, then much later on, the flow will, will still be turbulent and it will, will remain turbulent for all times. One of the issues we have is that turbulence advects downstream and you know, to, in, in practice, in, in experiments, it's hard to observe for very long times because your pipes typically are too short. I'll get back to this point. <clears throat> So let me now just um, give another example. This is channel flow, and, and here we go from high Reynolds numbers to, to lower Reynolds numbers. We have several snapshots. I have the Reynolds number values up on here. And you see, you know, here everything is uniformly, more or less uniformly dark. So that's actually fully turbulent flow. We look at the channel from above, and we have some, some flow visualization particles in there. Here you get a sort of crisscrossing stripe pattern that thins out as we reduce Reynolds number. And then you get to, to more or less isolated stripes at, at sort of the lowest Reynolds numbers where we can still observe some turbulence in the flow. And the rest of the flow is you know, pretty much laminar in between. So similar to pipes, but now of course you have an additional Spanwise dimension to worry about. So, if we reduce the Reynolds number even further, we just turbulence just happens to disappear at some point. But but in a way which we will see, which is to do with with transient uh, and and turbulence doesn't simplify to to some less complicated state. So you either have turbulence or you have laminar flow, and this is one of the, the key problems in, in understanding what is going on. Uh, let me now um, introduce very briefly some ideas uh, that some of you may, may be familiar with, also from Phil's work, uh, which is that of, um, of um, let's call it exact coherent structures, which uh, are a dynamical systems view where, where we believe that these, these turbulent structures like stripes or the puffs are short for pipe flow ori originate from much simpler states, actually solutions, uh, periodic or, 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 or equilibrium solutions, actually periodic orbits or traveling waves of the governing equations. And um, I, you know, I, I just very briefly speak about this, but this is something you can typically never observe. If you could observe it, the whole problem would be much simpler. And I, I'm showing here a channel which we we tilted actually the domain so that the channel will appear, uh, the, sorry, the stripe in the channel will appear in this direction. The streamwise direction is 45 degrees to that. And, and this is pretty much the only simplifications we make and the channel has sort of finite width and, and spanwise and, and streamwise directions. And now if I, if I play this movie, as I said, you will see something that you will never see in a, in a real flow. Um, and it's just a simplification by, by rotating and, and, and having a, a finite size with periodic boundary conditions. So as we reduce Reynolds numbers to around 1,000, you see a nice stripe forming, which doesn't have ends, it's periodically connected. And as we, as we keep time going, so now we, we approach this regime where in the experiment everything relaminarizes, also in a simulation which is large enough in the domain where everything would relaminarize. 
Here, it doesn't relaminarize. It, it is transient, but we don't see that because it's long lived. And then, you know, sort of a miracle happens. You go to something perfectly regular, which is actually a periodic orbit. Now, in a larger domain, you know, and also here, this periodic orbit will be unstable if we, if we, if we uh, release these restrictions we have. And you, so you cannot observe it in, in practice, but I, I think still this is, is a very nice um, visualization um, to, to connect these uh, uh, turbulent structures to some underlying unstable solutions which under other conditions you wouldn't be able to, to observe. So just keep in mind, you know, we have some understanding where these things come from and dynamical systems uh, theory is, is very useful here. And this is equally, um, you know, there were a lot of uh, studies um, and, and including including the, the work of, of, of uh, people present here like Phil and, and also Kengo uh, did, did quite some work on this. On, on this dynamical systems aspect, but for a question about the critical point, these ideas won't be um, very useful. And, and let me just show for completeness. So also for pipe flow, we know about some solutions that look similar to, to puffs. This is actually again in a symmetry subspace, and this is an edge state um, for specialists. So it, it is, a solution that arises at much lower Reynolds numbers. However, it is unstable. It goes through some bifurcation sequence to chaos, and then it becomes transient. So all of this we can understand from this dynamical systems perspective. But once it becomes transient, so it has a finite lifetime, it is already rather high dimensional, and um, then we lose track of it. And there's a, a, there's a gap in Reynolds number for pipes, you know, around 1550 or 1500 here to uh, close to 2000 where we uh, have sort of very limited understanding of of the details of what is going on but then if we if we jump over this gap and we we go now to um, observations of the full problem so we, we do a full dns without symmetry symmetry constraints or we do an experiment most of the data I will show is from experiment, but the visualizations here are nicer from, from a DNS study. So we look at a cross section of a pipe, which is somewhat longer than what you see here in the movie. And this is one puff that uh, at Reynolds 1850, and we're in a cool moving frame of reference. And if you observe this puff, it turns out to be also transient. So I just said, uh, these, um, these states uh, at low Reynolds numbers become transient. And when we can catch up with things again at somewhat higher Reynolds numbers, you just saw this puff disappear. It has a finite lifetime. Now what we can do is we can look at very many puffs. Doesn't matter if in experiments or simulations, uh, just, you know, this is uh, showing the energy, turbulent kinetic energy of a puff at a given Reynolds number. The movie you just saw is, is this green one here. It lived for a certain time and then it decayed. If we go to higher Reynolds numbers, the um, lifetimes typically will be longer. So let's pick this red one, but this is just an example. There, there will be some which live much longer, others which live shorter. And um, it bounces around on this higher energy level, and then it also decays rather sharply. And if I go to even higher Reynolds numbers, you know, 1950, then this puff lives much longer. It's obviously chaotic, and, and, but then the energy drops to, to, to the laminar base state eventually. And one thing to, to take note of is that this decay is always sharp, regardless of the lifetime of, this, of, the, of the puff. And this is reminiscent to a memoryless process. So we don't have an aging process where this puff kinetic energy would, would drop gradually over time until it's dead. But no, it survives on a certain uh, level for extremely long times. And then it decides to sharply and suddenly drop to zero. So this is reminiscent to, to memoryless processes. Pick your, your favorite examples like radioactive decay. And we can describe this puff transient nature in, in a very similar fashion where we, we uh, basically say this, um, uh, we, well, 
Okay, let me explain more slowly. We look at survival probabilities of puffs. So we pick out one Reynolds number. Let's pick the middle one, 1860, and we, we start with 200 puffs and we see how many of them survive, what percentage of them survives. Sorry, this is hard to read, 10 to the zero. So this is one, all of them survive up here. This is 10% uh, still alive, and, and this is 1% are still alive. And what you find is that this lifetime distribution falls on this exponential tail. This is a log scale. And this exponential tail is exactly uh, the signature of a Poisson or Memorial's process. And that means that our survival probability is an exponential with a slope of um, a, which corresponds to a character, characteristic time scale, this tall. You would call it half lifetime in, in radioactive decay. And, and this is basically exactly the slope of these exponentials, is this tall. Um, so that's how we can um, describe the statistics of these uh, puffs of their lifetimes. And um, now there, there had been a number of years back. Um, some claims that this lifetime of single puffs, or in this case it was stripes and quet flow, these are all for puffs and pipe flow, would diverge at the critical Reynolds numbers, number. And for pipes, all these different critical Reynolds numbers were suggested. So this is the Reynolds number where a single puff supposedly um, lives forever if you're above. If that was the case, this problem would again be easier to understand, and in a sort of dynamical systems context, this was corris would correspond to a bifurcation. However, um, as it turned out, so we, we tried to clarify in my group where this, uh, what the exact value of the critical point is, but what we found is something quite different. So here we plot tau as a function of Reynolds number. If that diverge, this curve should become vertical at some point. What you can see is it goes up extremely fast, actually faster than exponential. This is a log scale, but it never diverges. So there is no critical point that you could possibly define, but um, it only asymptotically uh, approaches an, an infinite value. This means that individual paths, at least as far as we know, never become sustained, but they are always transient, even though they have extremely long lifetimes. So here lifetimes are in, in terms of advective time units. It's a time unit, a puff uh, moves in one time unit, one diameter downstream, and you need already 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 of these units. So to observe the puff decay at Reynolds 2040, 50, you would have to wait about 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 pipe diameters. So your pipe has to be huge to make any such observations. So all this transient type behavior, you know, puts us in a different framework. So dynamical systems framework is not particularly useful to, to define the critical point here, but you have to use stochastic methods and it's a statistical mechanics framework that we, that we need. So um, let me then switch to the next process straight away which is one of, of, of spreading of turbulence. And the first mode of spreading is um, actually maybe a little bit unusual, but it's called puff splitting. So we start with a single puff at higher Reynolds number. This is 2,300. Again, we are in a co-moving frame of reference in this, in this uh, simulation. We have periodic boundary conditions. Just for convenience, it's, it's easier to observe in, in the DNS. And you see some vorticity um, escaped from the parent puff and seeded a new a second puff downstream. Now we went from one to two puffs, so that's um, you know increase in turbulent fraction. Turns out this is exactly also. I'm showing this now. It's a, it's also a memoryless process. You cannot predict when the splitting is going to happen, but the probability to split is constant in time. So. Just like the, the decay of, of turbulence, which I show here, the finite lifetime. So that's the memoryless process. Now the growth process is also a memoryless one. And we can do exactly the same measurements. Just now you don't look for a puff to decay, but you look for puffs to split. And then you will find that this characteristic time scale of this process, so call it tall split, uh, instead of tall decay, and plotting both here on, on top of each other. The, the colorful ones are now the tall split. Uh, this time scale goes down with Reynolds number. It starts from huge values. So at, at Reynolds 2000, you have to wait uh, around 10 to the 8 advective time units for such a splitting on average to happen. And this time scale 
decreases as we increase Reynolds number, whereas the time scale for, for decays of puffs increases and these two curves intersect. So why is this meaningful? Well, they intersect if you go to the left of the intersection point, um, the, the decay of puffs will happen faster and it will outweigh any growth. Now, you, you have to, 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 to view this sort of as a stochastic process. You have to look at many of those puffs and, and think of it in the thermodynamic limit. So it doesn't make sense to just have one puff in your pipe, but you would have to have very many. And then think about, you know, are, are all my puffs going to decay at the end if I wait for, for, for very long times? And as I said, if you're to the left of the intersection point, they will decay. If you're to the right of the intersection point, your uh, growth process, puff splitting, will happen faster. It will outweigh the, um, the decay process, and um, you will have some, you know, um, growing fraction of turbulence until it goes to some equilibrium, of course, but uh, you will have a finite amount of turbulence left in your pipe after long times. So in this um, sense, this is exactly the critical point that, that, that Reynolds mentioned, you know, even though he didn't have statistical mechanics in mind, but that's the framework you need. And then you can define a critical uh, velocity, critical Reynolds number. If you're above this, um, and you perturb your flow at the entrance and so on, then at the end of your very long pipe, you will have some turbulence left in it. So in that spirit, this is exactly the critical point we're after. And the claim is that this corresponds to a non-equilibrium phase transition. Now in pipes, this is very difficult to, to, to actually observe because your turbulence always flows away from you and you know, exits your, your pipe in experiments. Likewise, in simulations, you would need very large domains which is, I guess, doable, but then at the same time, you need, um, you need uh, time scales of uh, at least order 10 to the 8 advective time units, and that would be a, a massive, huge uh, computation that, that simply, um, I wouldn't say it's completely impossible, but it, it would be extremely expensive to, to, to carry out such a simulation to, to, to see this critical point. Now, um, okay. Uh, this sort of stochastic nature of things, you know, with, with some puffs decaying, other puffs splitting, puts us, as I said, into a statistical mechanics framework. And we, if we think of this, this whole thing in sort of uh, now a one-dimensionalized version and, and, and discretized on a grid, um, a very simple um, model that, that bears some parallels to, to what I was just talking about is called directed percolation, which some of you may have heard of uh, last week. So I'll try to go over this fast. So time goes down, some axis missing here on that. So time goes down and we go in discrete steps from one level to the other on our diagonal grid. And this is our one spatial dimension. And you see that some of the nodes here are, are, are blue and others I left open. So the blue ones you can think about as turbulence or other contexts of direct percolation. You could think about these as uh, infected people um, in, in, a, in, a, in an epidemic, or you could think of it as local fire in, in, a, in a forest fire, which then spreads to, to neighboring sites. So let's think of it as, as, as an epidemic. And these are some sick people. And in the next step of time, this person has two contacts. So it's a very simple model. So it can spread to one of its two neighbors with some probability P, which I said. If this probability is smaller than 0.6 for something, we are below the critical point, And eventually, we will always um, die out. This is, you know, it's not obvious why the critical point is 0.64, but it uh, just happens to be for this direct percolation. If we are above this value, um, then we, we will spread, again, in the thermodynamic limit, you have to, to think of that not for a single seed, but for many sick people that can spread to their neighbors. And, and then um, in time, we will, we will percolate and um, the, the, the epidemic will continue. If we are far above, you know, many more people will get sick, but essentially it, it spreads. And yes, there's an exact critical point in between. Now, what, what is the parallel to, uh, to pipe flow? This was actually first pointed out by Pomo in, in 1986. 
Well, the main thing is that if at any point your your let's see let's say our grid goes further on here, our um, our virus would die out, so everybody is healthy for at one instant, then we are done. You know, then we we sort of won in case of of an epidemic. Um, um, like you managed in Australia, nobody will get sick without um, contacts, right? So um, then, then the epidemic is, is basically over. And this is what is called now in, the, in, the, in this direct percolation context that you have an, a unique absorbing state. So the healthy state here would be the absorbing state. People don't get sick with, without being infected. And the same thing is true for, for, for pipe flow and channel flows because the laminar flow is linearly stable. So once, if at one point in time, all my turbulent puffs have died out, I won't get turbulent puffs on their own account. You know, I would need finite amplitude perturbations, but, but this is sort of not allowed. So if I don't have a, a puff in my system, I, I remain laminar. So that's the un unique, uh, the unique absorbing state characteristic, and and this then brings me to characteristics of directed percolation. If you now want to identify if your system is in this directed percolation uh, universality class, the prediction is that if you look at the amount of turbulence after uh, you know transients have died out, so you look down here somewhere, uh, and and take uh, the average turbulence you have in your system, this. As you increase your, 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 your parameter, our case it will be the Reynolds number here, it's a probability, this should go up continuously with a power law. So from zero at the critical point, you go above zero, and this goes up with an exponent of 0.276. That's the prediction for one dimensional percolation. Second prediction is, uh, is, uh, um, is a um, correlation length related to a, a correlation length. And the third one is to a correlation time. And we can identify these also by critical exponents if we look at size distributions of these open spaces in, in, in this horizontal space or in the vertical time domain. And they should be distributed with power loss if you're close to the critical point. And there are two other numbers we have to check. If we get all three, then uh, we can be sure we are in the universality class of directed percolation. So this, as I said, this is now again for pipe flow, lifetime splitting times, this time plotted on double logarithmic, uh, sorry, it's invisible, but, but anyway, this is Reynolds number. This is 2040, the intersection point, the critical point. Now we can think of it in terms of, of, of shear flows in a little bit different manner where we, we rotate, we, we, we take a, a not a diagonal lattice, but a square lattice. So this would be one puff. Then I go down in time. I just pick some time step, let's say 10 to the 6 effective time units. I have a certain probability for this puff to survive. And it survived in this case. So I'm above the critical point. I pick 2060 in this case. So it's a very long lifetime. And uh, splitting will happen on much faster rates. So if I go, uh, you know, next time down, so no splitting, and it survived the, the, the parent puff, so this is always my parent puff here. Um, and then after, on average, five times 10 to the six time units, on average, the fifth step, I will have one splitting and, and so on. So I can play the stochastic game. And um, if I do that, I simulate this in, on my laptop, then I will find also with these slightly changed rules, I will fall exactly into the directed percolation universality. Okay, so you can think of it this way, you know, you have individual puffs, which are single sites, each site would correspond to one puff if it's blue, and this can split or it can live or decay. So that's in this context, all we, we input into this model and, and then you would find it's uh, in the direct percolation university. Because as I said, very hard to observe this in, in pipes, almost impossible because of the, the long time scale. So we went to a different problem. We built the Taylor Quet setup, uh, which is linearly stable. If I only rotate the outer cylinder, also we made the, the radius ratio extremely small. So it's only 250 microns, the width, whereas the, the azimuthal, well, the diameter is something like 23 centimeters, gives you an azimuthal aspect ratio of 5,000 so that you can fit very many stripes in the azimuthal direction. 
if you add perturbations, as I said, the flow is linearly stable. And in the height, we had to make it very short to, to, to keep accuracy. So we, we couldn't at the time make it large in, in both dimensions. So, uh, okay, I'll explain in a moment. You can, again, measure lifetimes of the turbulent puffs or stripes that you have in here. They are super exponential. And you can also measure the uh, splitting rates shown here. You have an intersection point, which is approximately your critical point. And then in this case, we can observe for extremely long times and we can look uh, close to the critical point what these quantities may be that I just introduced uh, about uh, identifying if it's directed percolation or not. So before I get to these quantities, let me just show this movie. So these are now stripes in our um, coet setup. So this is looking once around the azimuthal direction, we reconstructed from the experiment. We have um, seeding particles in the flow so that turbulent stripes look dark gray, whereas laminar regions look uh, light in, uh, in these lighter gray colors. Now, if there is um, you know, a perturbation of finite amplitude somewhere, this will pretty instantly grow, at least on the time scales we, we are interested in, into a stripe that fills the entire domain from top to bottom and equally in the depth uh, into the screen now it will it will fill it will fill the domain <clears throat> however it doesn't fill in the streamwise direction it has a finite length I, i'll get back to why these structures have finite length later on and um, then this makes it a, a one-dimensional problem so if i have a stripe if I want to get more turbulence, it can only um, increase um, its turbulent fraction in the azimuthal direction. The other two it fills already, and this can only happen by this puff splitting process that I introduced earlier. Likewise, these structures can interact. They can also kill each other if they get too close. So all of this is now in here, and we can, um, you know, without any approximations, we can just do the experiment and we can test if indeed this flow, the transition in this flow, falls into the direct percolation universality class. So when the flow, when I go to the right of the intersection point, will I get these signatures of direct percolation? Now to view this, we rotate this view by, by 180 degrees. We paint the puffs blue and the laminar regions around it yellow. This is exactly the same movie that you saw above here. I can play it again. And now we turn this into the space-time plot also evolving in time and you see at some points the puffs um, get sparse here they're quite dense you will see an occasion where they almost die out we are down to a single puff here but then it survived it spreads again and so on and so what you hopefully appreciate we can observe this because of the periodic asymmetric periodicity of the flow for extremely long times and we can do all the statistics we need so doing that, the first quantity we look at is in the top row. <clears throat> so we look at the turbulent fraction as we increase, and here the label is missing. This is Reynolds number, and this is this critical intersection point. What the exact numbers are doesn't really matter. It's 325 or 26 for the critical point. So that will be around 326, maybe one or two higher. But um, sorry, I um, don't show the Reynolds numbers here. And anyway, this is the turbulent fraction. This is what matters as we increase the Reynolds number and we have to perturb the flow, of course, otherwise it would re remain laminar for all times. But if we do that, then the turbulent fraction, the equilibrium turbulent fraction measured after a long time goes up from zero continuously and it happens to fall exactly on the right slope. In red, I always show the directed percolation prediction. This is on log log. So the predicted power law is exactly the correct slope at the critical point. And we also did this in direct numerical simulations, by the way, where we have less of a scaling range. But it, it all boils down to, you know, close enough to the critical point, you have exactly the signatures of direct percolation. In the second case, we looked at the correlation length distribution of laminar gaps in the space domain, in the space spatial direction. It has exactly the slope predicted, and here we even get a little over two decades in, in scaling range. So the laminar size distributions in the experiments and in the direct numerical simulations um, exactly point towards directed percolation. And here again in the time domain now, so just look at it as a correlation time, the prediction is that close to the critical point we should get this red slope. And 
also here over two decades in scaling ranges for these temporal gaps, we get exactly the slope predicted by direct percolation and likewise in the direct numerical simulations. So with that, we are done for this flow. And um, now it took us another five years to, to do what we initially wanted to do is to look at this in a, in a proper two-dimensional quad-like flow. Of course, the gap will be very narrow, I'm showing it sort of as a sketch here only, um, where, where the system is not only very large in the azimuthal aspect ratio, but also this uh, actual aspect ratio should be very large, order of many thousands. And we, we just managed this last year to finally get this to work. We, we have now an azimuthal aspect ratio of close to 4,000 and uh, um, actual aspect ratio of around 1,500. Uh, gap is again 250 microns. In terms of aspect ratios, think of it as a sheet of A4 paper. The thickness of your paper sheet is the depth or the, 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 the uh, spacing between the two walls. The, the length is the azimuthal length and the height of the A4 sheet is the, uh, is the actual um, height. So, and then in this A4 sheet, you know, we have water, well, or ethanol actually in this case, and we have to shear this to very high speeds to, to get to the right Reynolds numbers. So we, we have to go to 10 meters per second on the outer um, speed, the inner um, cylinder is stationary to, to get some turbulence in this sort of microfluidic um, setting. The flow is linearly stable and so on. Just like in the previous case, we have flakes to observe what's happening. And this is just for historic reasons. People have tried this before. Group at Sacle in the 1990s, they were aware of this directed percolation prediction by, by Pomo. However, their system was much, much smaller. So the aspect ratio is you know, more than a factor of 10 in, in both directions, smaller, um, much more an effect of 10 actually. And they found, um, you know, a discontinuous jump. This is turbulent fraction. This is Reynolds number from their paper. And they didn't find a continuous phase transition, no critical exponents, nothing of that sort. So now this is from our experiment. And uh, so this is the reconstruction of our turbulent stripes uh, close to the critical point. Again, we have periodic boundary conditions. We can get all the quantities we need. This would be far above critical where you get these crisscrossing stripes and, and, and the more regular stripe at even higher. So now we just do the experiment. And um, remember, now turbulence, I should explain from the movie, it can spread not only stripes by, by splitting, but they can also elongate. So we have two, at least two spreading mechanisms, and more importantly, it can spread in two dimensions. For two-dimensional directed percolations, two spatial dimensions, I should add, there's a different prediction for critical exponents. And um, so we still have three numbers, one for the turbulent fraction, one for the correlation in space, uh, so all the lengths in space, and what we cannot see in this in this uh, are the, the correlation times, of course, uh, in this movie. But these are still the three numbers we have to determine. And if we do that, but they are different ones from the ones I showed to you before. So it, instead of 0.276 for the um, for the turbulent fraction, we have 0.58 now as as the as the number uh, to look for. So this is the turbulent fraction. This is now the increasing Reynolds number plotted in relative terms to the, the critical point. So um, um, I hope you appreciate on this log, uh, log scale that we do have a power law indeed, so that that's already good. And as it happens, this, this data, so it's two different runs, one in, shown in blue, one in red, and in black is a directed percolation prediction for two-dimensional, spatially two-dimensional directed percolation. And we get um, exactly the right slope if we are close enough to the critical point. Second critical exponent was uh, the spatial gap distributions related to um, the uh, spatial correlation length at critical and also, this number is different from the 1D case, but we get exactly the right one uh, that's predicted from directed percolation in our quad experiment. Likewise, the time uh, correlation length is exactly the one predicted by directed percolation. So, uh, to conclude this, at uh, you know, at critical, we we exactly follow this uh, statistical mechanics framework. 
where, where things are basically uh, boiling down to these very simple rules. So if turbulence becomes sustained, it is because spreading outweighs um, decay. And yes, as I said, we're in this very simplistic statistical mechanics framework, but it answers for us the question, what is the nature of transition where turbulence becomes first sustained? So that's um, the main message of my talk. And now I'll, let me say a little bit more about directed percolation, and then we'll see how far I will get on, on other topics that I wanted to, to mention, like turbulence control. So there has been a lot of attention to, um, to this directed percolation framework recently in, in shear flows in general, for pipe flow, for channel flow, there's been experiments by Sano Tamai and uh, simulations by Manvil uh, Shimizu. Uh, boundary layers, even then there's Coet flow, I showed that was our work, but the left flow, a very nice study by, by Dwight Barkley and, and Lorette Tuckerman, Matthew Gentry, they found the critical exponents for this 2D setting in, in a simplified uh, model, uh, the left flow model. So um, then there's even Kolmogorov and annular Coet flow. So let me comment on, on channel flow. So you may think, now, okay, all these subcritical shear flows, you know, become sustained uh, with these very simple rules. You have a critical point and it's all explained by statistical mechanics and directed percolation. <laughs> channel flow. Um, so we tried to do experiments in channel flow to check uh, this um, Sano's uh, work basically, which, which left quite a number of questions open. So we look at, at single, uh, single stripes in our experiment, and as you will see, okay, stripes decay after some time, no surprise. But then you do the statistics, you look at lifetimes, so you look at, uh, let's say, 10,000 of these stripes at different Reynolds numbers, and this is a bit of a busy plot, sorry about that. Uh, channel flow experiments are now in red. So what I just showed to you, you know, this is again plotting survival probability as a function of time. We saw this plot several times before. This should fall on exponential tails. Now, if I do a simulation of channel flow in a periodic domain, so periodic boundary conditions, channel flow simulation, which people have done before for these lifetime studies. So I get stripes that, that are not localized they fall exactly on these exponential tails, like puffs do for pipe flow. So I also show puff lifetimes for pipe flow, which we saw before. So all of these are memorized processes. Now I localize my stripe in a DNS by making the domain larger, the blue plots, the uh, blue symbols. So this is a localized stripe in a DNS. It's not memoryless anymore. This is clearly not an exponential tail, but something that ages. So initially nothing happens, but as the stripe goes, goes as the stripes go older, the probability increases for them to decay. We don't have this constant probability um, in time anymore. So that is lost. The same thing in the experiment I showed to you at the beginning of the slide. Is shown in the red symbols, stripes are not memoryless in channel flow, stripes age. And this completely changes the rules of the game. And if I have an aging process, I cannot be in directed percolation. Same is true for splitting. So that, or let's call it stripe growth. It's sort of a different splitting process. But you see this one stripe, um, something breaks off at the end and you get a second stripe, which then can grow in parallel to it. So, it's two dimensional, right? It splits in one dimensional, but this one, if we could continue channels finite widths, this one would con then continue to grow also in the second dimension. And this is also an aging process. You see, this is, does not fall on, on a straight line, so the probability to split um, increases in time. Completely changes the rules of the game, so I would, with that, believe that channel flow cannot be direct percolation. So not necessarily all subcritical shear flows are in direct percolation. I could tell you now why channel flow is different, but I, I, I don't have time for that. So let me uh, move on and, and just introduce why is transitional turbulence localized? And this is probably where, where I have to, um, after a couple of movies after that slide may have to end. Um, so that brings me back to an observation we made about 10 years ago or 11 years ago, but anyhow, if you have two stripes and uh, two, sorry, two puffs, so that's a direct numerical simulation, if they're in too close proximity, the upstream puff will kill the downstream puff. So they clearly interact. 
And to understand why this happens, let us change frame of reference. And this was first actually explained nicely by Cass von Dorner, who was a PhD student in, in a group in Delft by Jerry Westerwell and Franz Neustadt. Um, and um, we should not view this path as moving downstream. Obviously, it moves downstream in the experiment, but we should rather uh, move it the other way, that this path actually has its active part, where, where turbulence is, is very active, but the leading edge of the path here that you see is pretty much uh, turbulence is dying out. So here everything decays, here everything is active. The reason for that is that upstream you have nice parabolic inflow, the laminar flow, there's a sharp interface from parabola to a flat um, velocity profile. Here vortices will make the velocity profile flat very fast in a, in a short uh, stretch in space. And this is actually where the interesting stuff happens. This is where energy is fed into the path. So you should view the path as a front moving into the laminar flow upstream and eating up the energy of the parabola. What comes out at the, at the front of the path, at the leading edge, is a very much blunted velocity profile. So this is you know, much flatter in the center. It has much less energy, much less shear in the center of the pipe. Uh, it's all, all shear is pushed into, into the thin boundary layers at the wall. And, and, and here, whatever I do, I can perturb this region. It, I, I won't be able to see any turbulence here at these low Reynolds numbers. And um, you know, when, when uh, Dwight Barkley found out about these um, properties, I guess from, from Van Dornes and from our studies that, that um, about these planted profiles. So he was very much familiar with, with um, trigger fronts and excitable media. I, I believe he, he, um, he spoke about that last week. I won't have much time uh, to, to explain this, but there's a very nice analogy now, you know, to, to fast, slow processes where the fast thing that happens are our turbulent fluctuations. They flatten the velocity profile. Flat velocity profile at these low Reynolds numbers cannot sustain turbulence. And then you need viscosity to act in space, which from the walls acts and makes this flat velocity profile more parabolic. If you're far enough downstream, it's parabolic enough, you can see the second path. So that's a, a slow process, the uh, viscous process, the, the fluctuations are the fast process. Mm -hmm. And this puts us directly into the framework of excitable media and you can plot certain quantities of a path you know, where you have an excitation, a spike, and then you have this, this dead zone, the flat velocity profile, where I cannot see the second puff. This would correspond to a refractory region, and this is exactly what a neuron uh, uh, would look like um, in, 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 the, in the excitable media context, um, with this uh, refractory phase here where I cannot put a second uh, spike on um, un, un, you know until I wait and 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 the, the the potential has recovered and then I can only put a second spike. So this Dwight Barkley nicely uh, recognized and 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 um, adapted his excitable media model to 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 cater for puffs, which is uh, um, you know very um, important because it also tells you then how the puff slug transition works. So what I told you in this talk about were only these localized structures of turbulence puffs that can spread in space, they can kill each other off, or they can decay on the because of finite lifetimes. Now, if you increase Reynolds number a little bit further, you go from 2000 to 2800, let's say, turbulence will spread in space and you get these um, slug-like structures. Um, and, and this is then what it looked like and would look like in space time. You start with a few seeds and they spread uh, with strong fronts and, and, um, and um, fill the pipe. Now that, that some quantity is about, about fronts, uh, which you can nicely match experiments with, the, with this model prediction of excitable media transition. Um, but I, I won't have time to, um, to explain that. Again, I assume Dwight Barkley um, Ex may have spoken about it last week, so those of you who saw the talk can, can connect this up. What I wanted to mention are some consequences for turbulence control. So that's the region I've been talking about if we look at friction factors. So that's laminar flow, you know, low friction factors, scale with minus, um, Reynolds to the minus one. If we get to turbulence, 
friction factors are much higher, fall off much more slowly with Reynolds numbers, so you have much higher friction. And of course, there's an incentive to reduce friction. And we know that the laminar state in principle is stable at all Reynolds numbers. So if we could jump from turbulence up here to the laminar flow, would be great. What I told you just now is turbulence at low Reynolds number at least does not like flat profiles. If the pro profile is too flat, uh, this is what causes um, puffs to exist in the first place and is the reason why turbulence is not space filling at low Reynolds numbers. Does this also work at high Reynolds numbers? Actually, we knew that already before, you know, all these excitable media um, explanations and, and this nice model by Dwight came. We already did some simulations where we forced profiles to be flat by adding a volume forcing to our DNS. This is a Reynolds number 2,400 or 500, where I would see slugs evolving in time. 2,600 probably. However, if I flatten the profile, so turbulence would never die out. If I flatten the profile, we are beyond this, this puff regime already. If I flatten the profile, um, however, turbulence does die out. So how can I do this in an experiment? So I, I show this experiment here, fully turbulent flow, um, Reynolds number well above transitional regime. So it's, let's say, 3,500 if I, if I remember correctly. So I have slack. Turbulence is space filling. So there's no way this is going to decay ever. What I do now is something very counterintuitive. I put some stirrers into my pipe where I whirl around the flow and I redistribute the shear in doing that and I flatten the profile even more than it already is done by turbulence. So I, I, I create all these small scale structures here. Um, uh, I make turbulence much finer scale which make the profile flat. If I do that, so I turn on these rotors, see it now, and the result, if I look at uh, 200 diameters downstream, is that this highly turbulent flow actually completely dies out, cannot be sustained. You can also think of this as a forest fire, if you like. You know, if you burn up all the wood, there's no way, you know, which I do here in space. So I put a very strong fire here. You know, this is in the context of excitable media. Then there's no fuel anymore downstream. My profile has just simply the, the, the wrong shape and it would need the long viscous time scale to recover. Again, important is this, this, this uh, fast, slow dynamics, and it doesn't have enough time to, to recover. Turbulence already dies before the profile has recovered. And this is what you can exploit to relaminalize flows. I just, just show two examples, one where we don't have the steroids on, one where we have them on. So just to prove that you know, downstream, everything would survive. <laughs> Unless we turn the rotors on. So now you can do this also in other ways. We, we try to think of various uh, creative ways of flattening velocity profiles. So one obvious one is to shift the pipe. We we'll shift it in the opposite direction in the, in the movie I show next. So if you shift it because of you know, no <coughs> lip boundary conditions, you, you necessarily flatten the profile in this. Uh, this will be a rather long stretch, a few hundred diameters of pipe, which we make movable between the two stationary pipes. And then we can go to very high Reynolds numbers. I think we achieved something like 60,000 or so. I, I show a movie for 5,000, otherwise it will be difficult to visualize with the, with the flow of particles. But it works up to any Reynolds numbers, we could test it. Um, so we shift now in the opposite direction, but never mind. So at some point so we have turbulent flow, now you see the pipe shifts. Now we have to wait. So now it stopped shifting. We have to wait for the flow from upstream to come in and we uh, it should maybe slow down. What you saw when we, when we shift the pipe initially here. So you go from a normal turbulent, average turbulent profile, the profile instantaneous measured with PID is shown. When we start shifting, oops, when we start shifting, everything goes flat. So we, we achieve exactly what we wanted. We wanted to have a blunt profile. We have a blunt profile. And now the prediction is turbulence cannot sustain. And if we wait a little bit, for the flow to experience this flat profile. You see turbulence thins out until the flow completely relaminarizes. If we waited even longer, there would be turbulence coming in from upstream. But this is just you know, proof of principle. If the profile is flat, turbulence dies. So we did this for a number of different methods, also in numerical simulations in green. All the others are from experiments. And we can shift now the, the turbulent friction um, 
all the way back down to laminar friction, we could achieve something in experiments like 80% drag reduction. In simulations, we can go even further. I think we achieved 95% or so in, in higher Reynolds number flows. Okay, so this is where I should probably stop. Um, 25 minutes over time, sorry. Uh, there's something else which is a connection to high Reynolds number turbulence, which I wanted to talk about, but uh, let me just comment on it. But let me just uh, make a summary. So. First message to keep in mind is, you know, critical point for, for turbulence in these uh, shear flows, like pipe flow, um, let's call them more generally um, shear, shear flows where the, the laminar state is, is linearly stable, um, is that um, for a specific case of pipe flow, the critical point is close to 2040, and you can define it by, by looking at the statistical pro processes. So you, you need to be in the statistical mechanics frame of reference. And this brings us to um, very simple um, types of phase transition, in this case, uh, directed percolation. It's a non-equilibrium phase transition, which I didn't explain, but. Apart from that, it's sort of the most basic um, non-equilibrium phase transition um, there is. And um, this first guess actually turned out to be exactly right, as I showed to you for the case of quet flow. Um, this certainly falls in, in one or in two spatial dimensions into the directed percolation universality class. We also believe that pipe flow will fall into that. However, there are more complications and the you know, there is work in pro progress on this. Um, the scaling range will be extremely small, but we believe also pipe flow to fall into this. Then uh, channel flow, however, has a different growth mechanism. It has an instability at the front of stripes, which I didn't mention, but this is the reason why you don't have these memories processes. You don't have these Markovian type processes anymore. And, and then this simple statistical mechanics directed population framework, at least, at the distances we could measure in experiments away from the critical point does not apply. So um, it is not directed percolation. So it doesn't apply to all shear flows, but for some it, it's quite useful. So then um, this excitable media notion, however, and the, the question, the simple question, why do puffs localized? Why are puffs localized? Why don't we have space filling turbulence at, at lower Reynolds numbers? These are very useful to, to progress to higher Reynolds numbers. And I, I showed you the example for, for how we can relaminarize flows. What I would, would have liked to add to this, I have a few backup slides, but we don't have time to do this, is to also show to you uh, some example of what we can learn about friction factor scaling starting right from Turbulent slugs, Reynolds number 2,800, 3,000, where, where turbulence is first space fitting, and something that scales through up to much higher Reynolds numbers. And we, we can learn something about um, how turbulence evolves and sort of a, a bottom up approach to turbulence. But let's stick to, to what, uh, what I mentioned here on the slide. So it's directed percolation for some flows. We can use, exploit some of these properties of, of transitional turbulence to uh, relaminarize relaminarize flows in pipes. And I should now um, thank many people so from my group. So there, let me just pick out a few. Grégoire Lemont uh, for the Quet experiments together with Lucas Klotz. Mukund did a lot of the pipe uh, experiments. So did David Scazzelli for turbulence control together with Jakob Kühnen. Uh, simulations by Chai, early experiments, Alberto de Losa, uh, and, and, and many, many others also in the machine shop um, who help people who have built the, the experiments, Kerstin Avila, and, and many collaborators also um, over the years. Uh, but with that, I should really stop and um, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Okay. Um, um, okay, thanks, Bjorn. Let me thank you uh, on behalf of everybody for. Uh, really uh, very, very stimulating talk. Uh, so if anybody has a question, if you want to raise your hand. But, but I mean, in the meantime, while people uh, do that, um, how much of this goes through to boundary layers where the, I guess the control parameters are, is basically the uh, streamized direction now. Um, is there any hope of control in... Um, oh, control, okay, okay. Um, 
Well, I mean, th this simple control, you know, only works for um, linearly stable flows. So at, yeah. at boundary layers, once you have a linear instability, there's you know, not much hope in doing that. I mean, you, you, you could maybe quench, I mean, I, I'm sure you can quench turbulence down. And in a way, if you, if you, if you use boundary layer suction, what you do is you flatten the profile, right? Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, you suck in the, the, the gradients closer to the wall, which is exactly what we, what we did for pipes, not with the same method, but in spirit. So I, I think mechanistically, it, it, it dies, I, I would hope. And, and this is something, you know, people should probably think about and, and explore these, these parallels that would be very interesting. However, what we exploited for pipe flow in, in our experiments is the linear stability, which kind of, you know, could in principle make it useful. In practice, so we spoke to a number of companies and so on, and, and it, it is actually not easy to achieve that in the laboratory. If you think about the real world pipeline with lots of kinks and, and, and curves and so on and, and bumps in it, uh, the, the perturbation level is always too high. Even if you can relaminarize at some point, you will only save in terms of energy if you can exploit it downstream and the flow doesn't become turbulent on its own account, right? So in, in practice, this will be very limited uh, to, to apply even in pipes. So in, in boundary layers, you know, I think parallels in, in, in terms of the spirit uh, from, from a more fundamental um, background would be would be very interesting to exploit. Uh, flattening profiles seem to be something that turbulence really doesn't like. Yeah, but there are boundary layers which um, are linearly unstable. But um, I mean, for example, the attachment line boundary layer on the fr front of a wing, uh, yeah. transition apparently takes place through a subcritical instability. Even right. though at high Reynolds numbers, it is linearly unstable. So. Maybe okay. More relevant to it, that kind of situation. In in that regime, it, this, I you know I wouldn't be surprised if if the same applies as as in pipe flow. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have uh, more questions? One at least. <laughs> Can also be simple questions. If I went too fast or didn't explain things well enough, you know. Just uh, complain. <laughs> Any questions out there? Uh, if you haven't uh, worked out how to raise your hand, just go ahead and ask uh, directly. Yeah, yeah, just uh, unmute and speak up, please. Must be stunned into silence. Should we have a price for the first person who asks the question? <laughs> Hi. C can I ask one? Sure. Uh, so, is there a physical reason for the path splitting? Right. So, um, yes. Uh, let's go back. I just go through the slides. Um, Or maybe let's go to, to one of the last slides. So let's let's pick this one, ignore the movie playing. Okay. So this is a path, but I, I'm you know I'm showing the velocity profile. So this is a real DNS simulation, and, and I'm I just average asymmetrically the velocity profiles and 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 and, and plot them here <coughs> in the pipe geometry. What you see here is is basically in color-coded um, turbulent kinetic energy above some threshold. So, so, so here is the active part of the puff. So this is where the puff lives and it feeds on this upstream um, energy that uh, the laminar flow that sort of runs into it um, provides for it. And the whole process is relying on that. You can also find an inflection point um, Sorry, right here at this point, uh, which we believe drives the whole the whole process. Now, as the vorticity um, proceeds downstream, the profile, as I said, you know that that's a feature of turbulence. You have eddies, streamwise eddies, transport low speed momentum from the wall to the center. So the center line velocity drops very sharply, 
your profile becomes flat. That's just a feature of, 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 of you know, um, of, um, of momentum transport by, by, by streamwise vortices. As this happens, um, things slow down and turbulence cannot be sustained at these Reynolds numbers, at these low Reynolds numbers. However, if some vorticity can escape, so you have this zone here, I mentioned briefly, I can perturb, you know, I can inject tur turbulence into here, it won't survive. If, however, some eddies manage to escape downstream somewhere, you know, past this blue region and can still be attached to the wall and, you know, to sort of survive sufficiently to, to, to grow once the energy is provided down here, then a, a second puff will grow. And this is a process of puff splitting and it's completely stochastic, you know. Turbulent eddies always shed downstream. If you look at this movie now, you see there's always these green, yellow eddies, streamwise eddies going one way or the other, um, being advected downstream. However, they all die in, in, this, in this example here. If one of them would manage to, to move far enough downstream, ignore the second part further downstream, and, and, and um, stay attached to the wall, it would be able to grow and seed a second puff. So that's what has to happen. You know, why it happens and, and how often it happens, I, I, I cannot say much about it. It's a stochastic process. So I, I yeah, that's as much as I, I can tell. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thanks for the question. Anybody else? Thank you for the talk. I just have a quick question. When you're talking about turbulence, <laughs> right, you're putting energy into the system. Right. And then you get rid of the turbulent kinetic energy downstream, right? Is yes. Any way to uh, some sort of telling how much energy, how, how efficient this uh, sort of um, controlling is going to be based on your killing the turbulent kinetic energy, ratio of killing turbulent kinetic energy to energy you're putting into the system. Right, so yes, I actually took exactly the, the figure out which was down here in, in, a, in a previous version of the talk. Yes, so in, 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 in direct numerical simulations, you can actually um, directly compute this. Um, and so you, you're right. I mean, we have to distort the velocity profile. So we, we add a body force term to the equations in the, in the DNS study. And this costs us energy. This is exactly correct. What you, however, do then gain is that um, as um, turbulence starts to, um, starts to decay, your um, profile can recover and it, it can... Um, it can um, sort of, you know, regain the, the laminar friction. Um, so even in the presence of, um, this is work by, by Song Bao Fang, one of my PhD students, his name should be on the slide here, but it isn't, sorry about that. So he computed um, exactly this, this difference in energy you input and energy you gain. And, you know, in DNS, you can easily do it in experiments. We, we don't have the all the information to, to do that. Um, you, you, do re you have a net energy gain at, at all Reynolds numbers. So he, he computed that for different Reynolds numbers. And if I remember correctly, it was about 30% of the energy that he has to input, you know, at, let's say Reynolds 5,000, roughly, to just give you, you know, I could be off by, by, by some margin here, but it will approximately be, be right. So 30% of energy you, you, you have to provide and, and then you, you, know, you, you still gain, um, say, 70% of, of energy you save by um, relaminarizing your flow and by making your velocity profile more parabolic. So you have a net energy gain in principle. Yes. Thank you. And, and uh, by the way, so, so this is a rather, you know, a simple brute force, let's call it, um, way of killing turbulence by flattening the profile. You, I, I don't use any information about turbulence. If I did it in a more clever way, and for sure there are, there are more subtle ways, you could for sure have a much bigger net energy gain. But, but the idea here was to, to have 
something which we can also apply in experiments, right? Where we don't need to have the full velocity uh, information to, to be able to control turbulence, but um, you know, where, where I just have one target profile, I don't care about what the flow does otherwise, you know, it's turbulent, but I have one target profile. If I can get the profile flat enough, if I can get to this target, then the prediction is flow has to relaminarize and it does exactly that. And um, yeah, this, as I, as I said, connects also to this whole uh, excitable media uh, idea. If I burn the you know, wood in a forest, it takes a long time to grow back. Likewise, if I flatten the profile in a pipe, viscously, it can only energize from the wall and that take, takes time. And this time scale is much longer than the time scale of, an, let's say, an eddy turnover time. And, and this is what we exploit for the um, turbulence control here. Okay. okay. Um, any more questions? Go back.